so I, I kind of kicked it off a little bit early talking about uh, traditional finance, decentralized finance. And so my talk today is about DeFi and how does it fit into the bank. Um, so I'm going to start off with just a simple primer of what is DeFi, and then I'm going to talk about the hallmarks of what creates the, essentially kicks off the wave of uh, what I call Web 3.0. Right now we're, I would, what I would call, we're in the AOL generation. We're in the sandbox generation. I don't know for how many people here remember using America Online, but that was very popular in the 90s. It was, a, it was kind of a sandbox way to get on the internet. When America didn't know about the internet, it was, hello, you've got mail. Simple, easy to use, um, and the web was a browser inside of AOL. That's where we are today. Um, and so, just a simple primer of DeFi, decentralized finance, it really started with Ethereum, like I was talking about earlier, this idea about program, uh, programmable money. So Bitcoin was a universal ledger, and Ethereum was the ledger plus a uh, state machine, uh, what they call the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine. It's a compiler, and you can essentially write computer code and upload it into the blockchain, or sorry, uh, execute it with the blockchain. That code will execute based upon the amount of Ethereum in the wallet, and it runs autonomously. So it allows all different types of technology to come about. Bitcoin 1.0, we had multi-sig, we had uh, different types of um, transactions uh, that, are, that are based on Bitcoin blockchain. You had the early version of ERC-20, which was called Color Coins. But in 2016, cryptocurrency really exploded uh, with essentially this, this vision of DeFi. Or sorry, 2017 really exploded with this vision of DeFi. 2016 Ethereum came, 2017 DeFi. What was the first DeFi element that appeared? It was MakerDAO, uh, DAI. I'm going to give you some Ethereum, and then I'm going to borrow some money because I don't want to sell my Ethereum. I think it's going to go higher, or whatever the reason might be. You don't want to sell your cryptocurrency. You borrow some dollars against it, and then you can repay it uh, for a rate. This was the very beginning of DeFi as the crypto lending. Um, additionally, from there, we started to go a little bit further, uh, not only into DeFi, but a few years later into uh, DeFi with decentralized trading, what they call the DEX. DEX is not a new idea, but it had been around for a while, but it was really with Ethereum that that concept of decentralized exchange exploded. And I was a big proponent of the DEX long before Ethereum. I was watching all these different types of DEX platforms come up online, but Ethereum really allowed for so many different protocols to come in. And the other critical element that really defined DeFi is stable points. Prior to stable points, we didn't have a good representation of the US dollar. Um, now today, we have multiple stable coins from top companies, from publicly traded companies, uh, well over, I believe, uh, I wanna say it's like 70 or $80 billion capitalization of stable coins in the market. This number is going to, mark my words, most likely grow over a trillion dollars in the years to come. Will it be private issuers? Will it be uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, the government? That is to be determined. But what we do know is that this concept of DeFi allows for global markets to become interoperable 24-7, and it is going to become the biggest trading, uh, lending, identity marketplaces that, that we've ever seen. Uh, and so DeFi has really started with MakerDAO, uh, continued with things like Uniswap, and now we're getting into all different types of more advanced technology, including decentralized identity. Uh, so with that, uh, let's start the, the presentation. Banking today is broken. It's fundamentally broken. It's one of the first things I realized at Metal when we were building the system is, you're telling me I can't reference a name on a credit card bin against the bin. So I'm going to use my anti-fraud software to detect to make sure that uh, this card payment appears to be authentic, but what happens if it, there's something that's wrong with it? Well, you're gonna get a text on your phone. Did you attempt to purchase this <laughs> purchase from Walgreens? One for yes, two for no. That's best guess technology. Same thing with ACH. Same thing with, uh, with a lot of the banking technology we see today. It is a messaging system that was built 30, 40 years ago. Bank identification number was on a piece of plastic that used to run a piece of carbon copy over and they'd literally keep the credit card number in the Macy's, in the store. That's where it started, right? And that is no good. Uh, in today's day and age, uh, merchant processors and services will tell you never copy the card, never keep that on file. You have to be PCI compliant if you're to store that information. 
So it's really crazy that we are still operating on this system of best guess technology, this kind of Rube Goldbergian system that we've strung together. But it's what we've got. Uh, and, the, and the system evolves slowly. So when you look at the newer credit cards, like the Apple card that's come out, you'll notice things. There's no number, there's no number on the front of the card anymore. There's no bin. Why is that? Because it's not secure. This system was built many, many years ago, decades ago, and it was built in a way that was really designed for a different age. Uh, in the 70s, it wasn't really, we weren't really thinking about, will someone on the other side of the world hack my credit card? Because how would they possibly get it? But now it's 2021, data breaches are prevalent, and we need a pull, we need a pull base, or sorry, push base system instead of a pull base system. The pull base system is, I'm gonna give you my information, and once you have that, you have free reign to debit and credit. Um, the push base system is much more different. It's, uh, when we're looking at blockchain, it is, the ability for us to essentially verify we are who we say we are. So simply giving you a card number is not enough. And in the future, we shouldn't have to worry about losing our card or replacing our cards. It costs the bank a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy. So how can we have better payment hardness, better anti-fraud, but also better customer experience? The other things that we discovered with cryptocurrency was it's 24 seven. It's round the clock, it's always available. And that is really, really critical uh, for this development of what we're calling Web 3.0. Um, high processing fees, $20, $60 wire, um, vulnerable to identity theft, like I said. Uh, unfortunately, there are markets all around the world where you can buy people's identity very cheaply and it's being sold. Um, how can we get past this point where those marketplaces are going away, where the fraud is starting to trim down to a level where customer service and the amount of retention that we can give businesses uh, for, for doing these financial transactions can be higher. Um, in general, cryptocurrency connects the world financially. And we saw that very early on in Meta. Um, blockchain fixes a lot of things, and I believe it fixes banking. You'll hear a lot of people say blockchain solves this and it solves that. Um, blockchain solves a very specific problem known as the Byzantine, Byzantinian uh, general's uh, consensus problem. And essentially it was just an idea that I can send a message through, you know, from, well, going all the way back to the history of how this was created, I can send a soldier through a village with a, with a special message and when he arrives on the other side to meet my troops on the other side, that message will not be uh, not be confused in any way, not, will not be uh, taken by the enemy, will not be changed. And that was a very hard computer science problem, but that problem was solved by uh, an alias known as Satoshi Nakamoto through creating the Bitcoin blockchain. Now we've moved on to that beyond just simple messaging and into uh, financial transactions, banking, identity, and these types of things. So you can imagine how incredibly important it is to have a digital identity that doesn't expose all of your information. I would much rather be at Marshall than the last four digits of my social security number. I'll say that much. Um, and this is a big problem. It's, there's identity theft is rampant. Uh, in general, transactions are slow. Banks are not connected. When there's a problem between one bank and another bank, what happens? The compliance officer picks up the phone and calls the other bank. Many times after that's happened, it's already too late. So how do we start to automate these things? How do we become global and 24 seven? Cryptocurrency, and, uh, and uh, banking are essentially going to meld together over the next few years. And I've been saying this since 2012, and I think people thought I was really crazy at that time. And every year, people start to say, huh, that's, that's really interesting. And I've watched this as this conference has got Money 2020 has gone from very traditional finance to more decentralized finance and cryptocurrency. So I wanna talk about uh, the four points that are essentially the hall hallmark of DeFi. Right now, uh, we're in what I call the AOL phase. And in DeFi, the AOL is MetaMask. Um, raise your hand if you've heard of MetaMask or are on MetaMask. So MetaMask is it's great, a lot of people are, are on it here. It's, it's a really simple piece of software. It's a, it's a browser plugin and extension. It allows you to do Ethereum and other uh, interactions with the web, with blockchain, with this, this little extension. It's the very beginning. So I, I noticed that not everyone raised their hands. Don't worry, in the future, you won't be raising your hand because it will just be ubiquitous. On our devices today, we have the hardware to do the device signing, to do everything we need. We just haven't implemented it yet. 
I would say Apple as a company is probably one of the few companies that has really made a lot of progress in this space. So the four hallmarks of what brings about Web 3.0. Uh, the first hallmark is interoperability. We have many different blockchains, but how can they communicate? And this is something I'm working on at my company with a blockchain we built called Proton, but there's many different attempts to do this. What's really important is that they all communicate together. So you think about the early web when we had AOL and CompuServe and MSN, what were they? Little sandboxes that don't talk to each other, right? And then we broke out of that box and we started using Netscape, Internet Explorer, the very early versions of the web browser. In the future, this technology for cryptocurrency signing, for identity, it will be in your browser. You won't need to download a MetaMask. You won't need to do anything like that. And we've already started to pioneer a little bit of this uh, at Metal with something called WebAuth.com. It does all the cryptocurrency signing in the browser. Web 3.0 is what it sounds like. It's not a complicated thing with, with seeds and mnemonics and all these things. It's Safari or Chrome doing everything you love with finance, with art, with blockchain, with technology, uh, and, it, and you don't even feel it. You don't even know that it's there. So the future of Web 3.0 is going to really begin to kick off when we have this interoperability be between blockchains. There's a lot of different projects working on it, but I do believe through this free market we'll see uh, the establish, uh, establishment of a dominance of uh, what is kind of the go-to standard. And we're starting to see the very beginning of that. The second hallmark is identity. Uh, right now, we don't have good identity. And um, I know there are a lot of people in the room that uh, come from a regulatory background or have a compliance background. Uh, it's very important that we conform to the BSA, the Bank Secrecy Act, and crypto. Cryptocurrency is in fact money, and uh, as this grows, we need to follow uh, the rules and laws of traditional money. So identity is the first step to that. And with the identity, we can also start to accrue all different types of different elements. We can interact with the bank, we can interact with the payment processor, but also when we're going to send uh, money to someone on the blockchain, how do we know they are who they say they are? When we buy an NFT, how do we know the art comes from the artist? When I'm sending money to Coinbase, how do I know that the address belongs to Coinbase? Or MetalPay? Right now we don't. It's 0x whatever and it's, it's very confusing. But in the future you can imagine it would say MetalPay.com checkmark, Coinbase.com checkmark. Just like the secured, uh, uh, just like SSL when we visit a website. If I'm going to my JP Morgan or Bank of America, uh, login, I'm going to look for that little green bar because I want encryption. This is the very beginning of DeFi. Identity establishes that, it makes it easier, and it also allows us to comply with regulations. But beyond the regulation, regulatory aspect, it's going to make the most brilliant financial products we've ever seen before. Um, the third area, the third hallmark of DeFi uh, is the ability to interact with the bank. Traditionally, banks have been very shy towards cryptocurrency. I understand why. Uh, when I first showed up on the scene in 2009, everybody was screaming, down with the banks. The banks are going away. Blockchain is going to replace them. But that's like saying movies are, are going away. You know, once Blockbuster goes out of business, that's it. Or did we get Netflix? Did we get streaming? It evolved. And that's what's going to happen to banking. So the third hallmark of DeFi is essentially banks integrated cryptocurrency starting with cryptocurrency custody, but leading into payment messaging, universal payment messaging in which a blockchain can tell a bank to debit a payment, credit a payment, uh, add or attest some piece of someone's identity, like a decentralized credit score. These are the three areas that are really beginning to allow DeFi to take off. And this is essentially, as, as these three areas are coming together, we're going to see an explosion in DeFi. The fourth hallmark of DeFi, and I believe it's happening today, is the adoption of traditional financial, financial institutions and the largest banks of the world. We see BNY Mellon adding cryptocurrency. Bank of America has more blockchain patents than any company in the world. JP Morgan Chase has their own blockchain core. This is not just a little trend. This is something that's here to stay, and I've been talking about it for about a decade, over a decade now, giving these lectures and talking about it. Five years from now, it's gonna be a very different speech, but we'll, most of us will remember this time when we were talking about the very beginning of DeFi. And what will this do? It will make financial markets 
24-7, globally interoperable. Every financial application will be able to talk to every financial application, and that's never been able to have, have been done before. You think about what email did for business, blockchain is going to do that for banking. And it's going to accelerate so fast that I would say by the next few years, you'll probably see Bitcoin and cryptocurrency deposits supported by every major bank. Um, don't hold me to it, but I think we'll see it. Um, so thinking through these, these, different, these different areas, custody, cryptocurrency custody services, you're going to see these growing. Cryptocurrency custody services becoming banks, banks becoming cryptocurrency custody services. This has already started, um, but it will grow and it will grow. Um, global customer base, we're going to start to really, really become interoperable uh, globally on, on financial markets. So uh, your Bank of America, your, your once Zelle account is soon probably going to become global. It used to be 50 states, now it's you know 40 countries, most likely, in the, in, the, in the near term. This is going to be made possible with blockchain. Who are the winners, who are the losers? I couldn't tell you, but I hope, I hope so. what we're working on, Proton and Metal, is one of the winners, and I feel that it just might be. We believe that through integrating this technology, we will usher in this Web 3.0. I can go into the different areas where I think it's going beyond that, um, but uh, this, this lecture today is just mostly about DeFi, but, but Web uh, 4.0 is going to go into um, essentially uh, the payment messaging, like I talked about, those hallmark items, and Web 5.0, 5 probably artificial intelligence or something like that. Uh, as we get closer to this, as more banks come online, as more services come online, the cryptocurrency market caps will grow as more people come in. Uh, not financial advice, cryptocurrency investing is risky, but it's obvious, according to Metcalf's law, the more users you have, the more adoption, the larger the network grows. And we've never seen an adoption cycle like this before. It is a flywheel that's self-powered, that you know started at, at seven transactions per second, and now we have blockchains going up to 400,000 transactions per second. Um, once we integrate de identity, once we have custody, once we have regulatory clarity, this is going to become a big part of the internet. Dare I say, the main topic of the internet. Um, another thing that's really important too to think about is the underbanked, financial inclusion. Uh, crypto, people in crypto talk about all the time, bank the unbanked, but who's really doing it, right? Who's really getting out there and banking the unbanked? A lot of cryptocurrency companies are finally starting to get into that area. In the beginning, it was a lot of talk. But now we're starting to see it. We're seeing it in El Salvador. We're seeing it in different parts around the world where you're seeing cryptocurrency being used uh, for commerce, for peer-to-peer -peer payments. Um, you know, seven transactions per second, very slow. 400,000, very fast. Uh, when we started, we thought Bitcoin was going to be a currency. But it turns out it's more of a store of value. Um, other blockchains provided other capabilities such as payment messaging and things like that. So when I can send a penny over the internet and it costs nothing, we're onto something. And this is the very beginning of microtransactions, it's the beginning of, of decentralized finance, and what we call decentralized finance in five, 10 years will probably have a new name. Traditional finance, which is the banking world, payments world we know today, uh, blockchain and what we call DeFi are going to merge into a completely new category. Right now, they're, they seem like polar opposites, but in fact, they're not. It's sort of like saying internet, the internet and banking don't go together. It is clearly defined the future of banking, the future of payments, um, and this is, this is the very beginning. Another thing that's really important to point out, and we discovered this in blockchain cryptocurrency, is that our security is not as good as we thought. When there's an issue, the banks, when, when you go to log in, the bank sends you a text message. What do we learn in cryptocurrency? Text messages can be hacked. Um, what do we also learn in cryptocurrency? Your identity is not as secure as you thought it was. You're uploading all of your information to all these different sites. Sometimes you don't need to, but that's the way that it, that's the way that it's being operated. If we take that that ownership uh, of the identity and storing the identity and start to put it into less hands and to use verifiers, universal at names that can attest your identity, attest your credit credit score, can link uh, legacy fiat interactions into this global network, it's going to be the biggest explosion in business and banking we've ever seen. Um, and so, um, at Metal we're building this. We're building this technology, we're very excited. I started in uh, with Metal in 2015, myself and my co-founder, Glenn Marion, 
uh, I met him through Dogecoin. Glenn built the first Dogecoin wallet, and we both have like a very funny sense of humor, so we connected, became good friends, and we built the app you know today is Metal Pay. It's live in the US, and, and very soon it's going to be global. We had this vision of building a cryptocurrency PayPal, PayPal for cryptocurrency. And at the time, it seemed crazy uh, six years ago. But now, today, PayPal has entered cryptocurrency. I just opened my Venmo account the other day, and they asked me if I wanted crypto roundups on a Venmo credit card. That's incredible. Metal is building these things, and not only are we focused on the business, but we're also focused on the thought leadership and the vision. And the vision is banks talking to blockchains and blockchains talking to banks. Thank you, everyone.